Well, as I said, we're at the third Sunday of Advent. And the third Sunday of Advent, in some traditions, is called Gaudate Sunday. Gaudate is Latin, it means rejoice. And fittingly, we lit the candle of joy today, and then heard two scripture readings that spill over with exuberant joy. Uh, the passage from Zephaniah and the one from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Well then the lectionary adds a gospel reading with our classic curmudgeon to it. The Bruder Vipers guy from the Jordan River. John the Baptist with his special airing of grievances we hear. And, you know, I don't know who paired these readings together, you know, but it's almost kind of funny how they counter each other. You know, rejoice, you brood of vipers. You know, it just doesn't quite seem to fit somehow. But isn't that somewhat representative of our world and our communities these days? trying to mix things that just don't quite fit. And even in the midst of joy and anticipation, there's always one spoiler somewhere, right? You know, mm -hmm. and to be honest, sometimes the so-called party poopers are the most realistic people who keep <coughs> us aware of the problems that we're facing. You know, they may provide an important counterbalance to those who want to see only the good. You know, light and darkness are in permanent struggle. And John the Baptist relentlessly points out the shadows of humanity so that we may find our way back to the light. He constantly tells us, repent, you must change. You've got a long way to go. And we hear that right after we hear Zephaniah saying, Rejoice, people, you're almost there. And John saying, You have a long way to go. So that's what we're up against. And Wednesday, I changed my preaching plan for today. I, I had planned to use the uh, lectionary text that's actually scheduled for today from Matthew, where John is in prison waiting to be beheaded because he scolded King Herod for marrying his own brother's wife. But then I came across a piece of news that caught my eye because it was about the Holy Land. And it especially interested me because it was good news from the Holy Land. Rejoice, I thought. You know, let's face it, news from that hallowed ground over there between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea is not usually good news, is it? I mean, the angels don't seem to be singing peace on earth in most of the news reports we hear coming out from Israel and Palestine. So I was delighted, delighted and rejoiced over this peace of news that I saw. And it was about the site of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, not far from where John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord, not far from where he met the crowds and chastised those people who he felt were overly comfortable. And the site of Jesus' baptism is a little watering hole in the Jordan Creek. <clears throat> and I call it the Jordan Creek because these days it's only slightly bigger than Shemokin Creek, really. Uh, Syria, Jordan, and Israel have all diverted water away from the river for various purposes. And so it's not the swollen, rushing river it had been back in the day. And yet they preserved this little site of a pool off to the side of the river where uh, they say Jesus was baptized. And I've seen pictures of this place before. Dr. David Dorsey from our seminary was there a number of years ago and he brought back many pictures. 
Well, what I didn't know about it was even though pilgrims have been able to visit that small area there along the river bank, there's a wider zone there of 250 plus acres, which includes churches of several different Christian denominations. And it has been off limits for some 50 years. The reason? Well, there's about 3,000 anti-tank landmines right there around all those churches. And those landmines were placed there by the Israeli military during its conflict with Jordanian forces back in 1967 during the Six-Day War. Okay? And that area then was officially evacuated by the Israeli government in 1970. And that area that has all the landmines and booby traps around it includes a Catholic chapel belonging to the Franciscans, uh, Greek and Ethiopian Orthodox monasteries, Russian and Coptic Orthodox churches, and all those places of worship have been off limits and deteriorating ever since, until now. And when I read the backstory here, I thought, well, it gives a whole new appreciation of the notion that God comes into this world. A whole new understanding of light coming into the darkness. Because think about this, for the last 50 years, the place where the light broke through and where the Spirit of God descended into this world onto Jesus has been surrounded by thousands of heavy-duty landmines with the potential to rip apart and kill any human body that might venture out just a little too far to worship. But nevertheless, Pilgrims have been traveling to visit that place, happy and rejoicing to see where Jesus was baptized, while again, just a few hundred yards away, it is filled with deadly landmines. So it's just really ironic, you know, that whole situation there it has been, and yet somehow it just sort of seems to ring true for the spiritual battle that's been going on in this world since then and for a long time. It just seems it's never easy for the good forces in this world. But now, and this is a good news, churches at the site are expected to reopen within a year, sometime in 2020 they're hoping, following progress on a project that's been going on this year to clear those thousands of landmines and other booby traps from all around that location. And in a recent statement, the Israeli government and Halo Trust, which is an international anti-landmine removal organization, they praise the progress of effort, efforts to clear those explosives from the Holy Land because it was about a year ago, I think 2018 in December, that they announced that was going to take place. So they've been working on it all throughout this year. And I saw a little video a few months ago where they actually exploded some 900 of the landmines all at one time to, to destroy it. And they've been working on it then ever since. And this area is located about 10 kilometers east of the city of Jericho. <coughs> and this little place is one of the most storied and holy religious sites on earth. Because in addition to Jesus' baptism, it's also widely believed to be the location where the Israelites crossed the River Jordan into the Promised Land and where the prophet Elijah was taken up into heaven. All right here. And landmines are being cleared from that place as we speak. So rejoice, I thought. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, 
How is this then for an Advent analogy or a metaphor? Christ is coming to clear the landmines from our lives. Okay, we can use it that way. And you know, I know the term landmine is strong ammunition for that, right? <laughs> but aren't there, think about it, aren't there in some of our families and communities emotional landmines? Things that you can't talk about? Things that are closed off from conversation? Things that'll hurt simply by mentioning the topic? Those sound like landmines to me. And I'm certainly not here today to tell anyone to go out there and start diffusing those landmines right now, okay? Because just as with the real landmines along the Israeli-Jordanian border, that can be dangerous stuff that can explode in your face if you're not careful, all right? But neither should we give up hope that we could one day talk about these things. <coughs> Listen to one another. Understand each other. Forgive each other. Clear the borders between us and clean up the booby traps. I was thinking about this, you know, along with our support group where we often deal with these kind of topics too. And it just really seemed to fit as something to talk about today. And by adding those types of situations to our list of Advent hopes and prayers, we can acknowledge our own limitations, but at the same time, we do not give up hope, and we wait patiently for an opening. There may soon come a day when we can rejoice. And meanwhile, there is our curmudgeon, John the Baptist, whose name, by the way, means God is grace. He comes across as pretty ungracefully direct, doesn't he? He keeps it very practical. His call is to repentance. Repent, he says, and he is anchoring everything in the here and now, in what people do, in the nitty-gritty dailiness of everyone's particular life. So, with him, instead of waiting for a holy someday that may or may not come, instead of betting on the famous magic silver bullet that will solve all of our woes at once, John suggests to inhabit the stuff of our lives as deeply and as generously as we can right now. Share now, he says. Be merciful now. Do justice now. And he suggests common sense things, not overly idealistic, to the taxpayers, he says, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. To the mercenaries, he says, don't extort money by threats or false accusations. Be satisfied with your wages. And to the Pharisees and Sadducees, he says, don't allow your religious heritage to make you arrogant or complacent. And then to everyone who has anything, John is saying, you have gifts to give. So stop hoarding. Stop procrastinating. Use what you have. Give what you've got. All very reasonable suggestions, are they not? And so, I wanted to say ask you to think about this. If you were facing John today, what do you think John might say to you? <laughs> think of just one practical adjustment that would make a difference in your life and in the lives of others. Think of one area where God is calling your name. 
nothing is too small or too trivial to make a difference, okay? But for now, I'll suggest that you can still just leave the landmines where they are, okay? But don't give up hope. Keep an open heart. Wait for an opening that God will bring. And one day they will be removed, either in this life or in the next. But either way, it will be a day of great rejoicing and exuberance when it happens. For God will then be in the center of our joy, turning those fields of war into fields of hope, peace, and joy. Because only God can turn landmines into tidings of comfort and joy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so go date. <laughs> All right, let us rejoice, for that day will surely come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.